Mexico sends its people, they're not sending their best. They're not sending you. They're not sending you. They're sending people that have lots of problems and they're bringing those problems with us. They're bringing drugs, they're bringing crime, they're rapists, and some, I assume, are good people. But I speak to border guards and they tell us what we're getting. And it only makes common sense. It only makes common sense. They're sending us not the right people. It's coming from more than Mexico. It's coming from all over South and Latin America, and it's coming probably, probably from the Middle East. But we don't know, because we have no protection and we have no competence. We don't know what's happening. And it's got to stop. And it's got to stop fast. They showed up in Charlottesville to protest. Excuse me. They didn't put themselves down as you. And you had some very bad people in that group. But you also had people that were very fine people on both sides. You had people in that group. Excuse me. Excuse me. I saw the same pictures as you did. You had people in that group that were there to protest the taking down of, to them, a very, very important statue and the renaming of a park from Robert E. Lee to another name. Fourteen thousand apartments in 39 different buildings, all mostly white tenants. That is, until the Department of Justice took notice in 1973 and slammed Donald Trump and his father Fred Trump with a lawsuit. Trump management was charged with discriminating against African Americans and breaking federal law. Donald Trump, then just 27, was president of the company. The Department of Justice accused the Trumps of violating the Fair Housing Act, arguing they were turning away renters based on race and color. Who tipped them off? Local activists, so-called testers, posing as potential renters at Trump's buildings, mainly in Brooklyn and Queens. Elise Goldweber was a lawyer for the DOJ's Fair Housing section at the time and was called on to handle the Trump case. When the black testers came, they were shown, they, they may have been shown apartments, but were told nothing was available. Whereas when the white testers came, yes, there were, were things that were available. That would be the norm. And if the Trumps did rent to a black person, Goldweber recalls, they would do so only at one building in Brooklyn, reserving the other buildings for white tenants that the white people would live in Trump Village and the uh, people of color would um, live in Flatbush. And according to the Justice Department, they even had a secret coding system to do it, a racial code. Here's how. Some of the applications were marked with a C, which we learned that it meant colored, so that the, the prospective tenants who had come in um, were noted to be colored. Yes, you heard her right. The Department of Justice alleged applications submitted by prospective African-American renters were designated with a secret code, such as C for colored, to indicate a black person was looking to rent. In true Trump fashion, Donald Trump hit back, calling the government's accusations absolutely ridiculous and telling the court, 
I have never, nor has anyone in my organization ever, to the best of my knowledge, discriminated or shown bias in the renting of our apartments. Trump's lawyer said the government's suit failed to give names, addresses, or specific incidences of discrimination. Claiming the lawsuit caused substantial damage to their business and reputation, Trump took the most unusual step of suing the Justice Department for defamation, seeking $100 million in damages. But that countersuit was tossed out by the judge. Even so, the Trump family maintained they never discriminated based on color but were instead trying to avoid renting to people on welfare. Two years later, in 1975, Trump and his father settled the case, agreeing not to discriminate against anyone. They also promised to advertise in publications aimed at minorities, familiarize themselves with the details of the Fair Housing Act, and notify civil rights groups of apartment vacancies. The Department of Justice claimed victory, but the Trumps never admitted any wrongdoing reportedly noting the settlement was in no way an admission of a violation. Maybe hate is what we need if we're going to get something done. I felt like they might take us to the back of the precinct and kill us. This is a hugely important story. I wish I could tell you it was unique that five black and Hispanic boys were uh, arrested for a crime they didn't do and sent away for a crime they didn't do. But unfortunately, it's all too common in the United States. And so uh, Central Park Five has to be emblematic for a lot of other people whose stories aren't told. There was a orange-haired real estate de developer in New York at the time of the Central Park Jogger case who took out full-page ads in all the daily newspapers asking for the return of the death penalty and more police. Of course I hate these people. And let's all hate these people because maybe hate is what we need if we're going to get something done. And he believed that these children should be executed even though, of course, even the return of the death penalty would disqualify the execution of children. It was horrific then, it's horrific to hear it now. And it's more than anger, it's hatred. And I want society to hate them. We should be talking about it, talking to the now men who went through this and always having our ear to the ground to this pernicious racism in our country that exists despite the fact that we know in our hearts that you judge a person by the content of their character and not by the color of their skin. I'm quoting uh, Dr. Martin Luther King. Five, Jason, exonerated.
There have been videos and movies shown about the case. The news came out with a full page ad saying that they should die, that they should have the death penalty. Why do you bring that question up now? It's an interesting time to bring it up. Uh, you have people on both sides of that. They admitted their guilt. If you look at Linda Fairstein and if you look at some of the prosecutors, uh, they think that the city should never have settled that case. So we'll leave it at that. A well-educated black has a tremendous advantage over a well-educated white in terms of the job market. And I think sometimes a black may think that they don't really have the advantage or this or that, but in actuality, today, currently, it's, uh, it's, a, it's a great, I've said on occasion, even about myself, if I were starting off today, I would love to be a well-educated black because I really believe they do have an actual advantage today. Black in America mean to you? Well, I certainly don't agree with that that garbage that Donald Trump said that uh, <laughs> that if he could be reborn and reincarnated, he want to come back as an educated black because uh, we start off. I mean, he, he, Brian, I didn't believe he said that. I mean, it's, 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 it's crazy. <laughs> Out front now, former president and chief operating officer of Trump Plaza Hotel and Casino, Jack O'Donnell. He's also the author of the book, Trumped, the inside story of the real Donald Trump, his cunning rise and spectacular fall. Um, Jack, good to have you back. So when you uh, learned, uh, when you, you say that when Trump learned you were writing this book, right? You were writing this book back in 1990. Then one of his lawyers uh, reached out, tried to pay you off. Tell me what happened. Well, he, he didn't just reach out, Aaron, and thank you for having me, by the way. Uh, unannounced at my office, I was working for Merv Griffin by then, um, the attorney showed up at my office, walked in unannounced, um, and said he wanted to talk to me. Um, he said, we've heard about the book, we want to know what we can do to, to, you know, to have you kill it. Hmm. What do you need? And I said, I said, Joe, I don't need anything. I said, the book is way beyond that point, and I need to write this book anyhow to set the record straight on a few issues. So, but he clearly was offering um, money, money if I if, if okay. I would uh, kill the publication of the book. So you say, in addition to that, and I, I presume, you know, you're saying it was very clear, but obviously it doesn't sound like it was explicit in terms of amount or anything like that, but you also received threats, warnings. What were they? Are these things that you think Omarosa should be thinking about now? Well, immediately, uh, you know, during that conversation, it, when he realized that I would not take money, the threats started right then and there, face to face. Hmm. The attorney then told me that he was sorry that he, you know, that that, that was my position, and that what they were going to do next was that they were going to go out on a campaign to try to ruin my marriage by creating stories that I was having affairs. They also went on to say that they were going to ruin my career professionally, and they were going to try to tie my business ethics into uh, a customer who was allegedly an organized crime member and made it very clear to me that that they were going to ruin my life um, at, you know right then and there after that time um, and I did report that to the Division of Gaming Enforcement in New Jersey the next day because yeah. I thought the threats were so serious but the threats didn't stop after that Aaron uh, they continued. I, I got not only anonymous threats, but I was told by another executive in the organization to be careful, that I was being followed 24-7, that they were going to wow. do anything that they could to get their hands on that manuscript. 
And obviously you did go ahead and publish it. I mean, Amorosa now has gone ahead with, with her book, which, you know, look, it, there appear to be some serious factual errors in there, but she does have tapes, uh, which have come out and raised questions. Uh, the president has responded by calling her a loser, a lowlife, and a dog, among other things. Do you think his attacks on Amorosa are racist? Well, I absolutely do. I think that maybe, you know, people associate the negative connotation of a dog with a woman uh, when they say, you know, when they use it that way. So I think that's normal. But I think combined with Amorosa uh, being a woman and an African-American, I think he's used it very strategically. And listen, he does have a very long history. He is a racist through and through. He doesn't have to use the word N-word for it to become very clear what he is. And, and I think in this case, use that word I think he used it very right? strategically. The N-word itself, just to be clear. Aaron, he, no, I, I, no, to be clear, he never used that okay. word in front of me. And the multiple times that he talked negatively about blacks, Puerto Ricans in particular, and women, and, and also, by the way, people with lower economic capability, he talked very derogatively about all four of those groups I wanna, of people. Can I quote But he never Jack did use that from, word. Okay. And, and to your point, though, I think what, what you're trying to say is he didn't use that word, but he did express incredibly racist sentiments. And, and I want to quote from your book. Um, you say, and this is you quoting Trump, quote, I've got black accountants at Trump Castle and at Trump Plaza. Black guys counting my money. I hate it. The only kind of people I want counting my money are short guys that wear yarmulkes every day. I think the guy is lazy. It's probably not his fault because laziness is a trade in blacks. It really is. I believe that. It's not anything they can control. I mean, just let that sink in to everybody uh, for a moment, Jack. And then let me ask you a very just important question, I think. Did you write this down right after? I mean, was that off a tape? I mean, are you, you put it in quotes. Is that truly in quotes? That's what, that's what he yeah. said? Yeah. Yeah. I I, I did write that down, Aaron, right after it happened. And also when I came back from that meeting at Trump Tower in New York, this was prior to the accident, and I was the, the present chief operating officer, but we, I had a, a gentleman, Steve Hyde, and I, that I reported to, and I told him about it, because I was concerned, um, that, because that was really the first time that it became crystal clear how Donald thought about black people. And then you went on to, the, is this you discussing Indian blood? We're going to judge people by whether they have Indian blood, whether they're qualified to run a gaming casino or not? Uh, uh, that probably is me, absolutely. Because I'll tell you what, if you look, if you look at some of the reservations that you've approved you sir and your great wisdom have approved i will tell you right now uh they don't look like indians to me and they don't look like the indians now maybe we say politically correct or not politically correct they don't look like indians to me and they don't look like indians to indians and a lot of people are laughing at it and you're telling how tough it is how rough it is to get approved well you go up to connecticut and you look now they don't look like indians to me sir Thank God that's not the test of whether or not people have rights in this country or not, whether or not they pass your look test. Depends whether, yeah, depends whether or not you're approving it, sir. No, no, it's not a question whether I'm approving it. It's not a question whether I'm approving it. Mr. Trump, do you know, you know in the history of this country where we've heard this discussion before? They don't look Jewish to me. Oh, really? They don't look well, Indian to me. They don't look Italian to me. Mm -hmm. And that was a test for whether people could go into business or not go into business, whether they could get a bank loan. You're too black. You're not black enough. I want to find out. That's you the, Well, then why are you appro you're approving for Indian? Why don't you approve it for everybody then, sir? If your case is non-discriminatory, why don't you approve for everybody? You're saying only Indians. Wait a minute, sir. You're saying only Indians can have the reservations. Only Indians can have the gaming. So why aren't you approving it for everybody? Why are you being discriminatory? Why is it that the Indians don't pay tax? but everybody else does, I do. Why is it that I pay tax? Why is it that senior citizens get tremendous benefit from the taxes that a certain industry does, but the Indians aren't contributing to that? Why aren't the Indians, excuse me, sir, why aren't the Indians that are making all the money in Connecticut, which is the most successful of the Indian reservations, 
Why aren't they spreading the wealth with the other Indians? Sir? Why don't you do something for the other Indians that are living in total poverty? Because you know why? Because their reservation Trump, is too far away. If you give the away. chairman a chance to answer your questions, I'm sure he will. I'm sure he will. Absolutely. The presidential campaign took a sudden detour today back to President Obama's origins. For the first time, Donald Trump said publicly that the president is indeed American by birth. But in the process, he stirred up a new storm of criticism. For the presidential opponents, both holding events within blocks of the White House, the day was a battle over truth. His aides had said it recently, but for the first time, Donald Trump himself acknowledged President Obama is a natural-born American citizen. President Barack Obama was born in the United States, period. Now, we all want to get back to making America strong and great again. It was a complete reversal for the man who spent years stoking the so-called birther controversy. This is on the Today Show in 2011. You are not allowed to be a president if you're not born in this country. He may not have been born in this country. When the White House made the president's birth certificate public two weeks later, Trump questioned if the document was real. And even as a presidential candidate, in January of this year, Trump refused to acknowledge the president was indeed born in Hawaii. Was he a natural born citizen? Who knows? Who knows? Let's, who, who cares right now? Today, clearly, Hillary Clinton cared even before Trump spoke. For five years, he has led the birther movement to delegitimize our first black president. His campaign was founded on this outrageous lie. There is no erasing it in history. There was more outrage from members of the Congressional Black Caucus who said Trump is unrepentant and an opportunist. By any definition, Donald Trump is a disgusting fraud. The birther movement had its birth in Barack Obama's first presidential run when some Democrats wanted to stop him and hit on this idea that maybe he wasn't born in the United States and wasn't eligible. Hillary Clinton never embraced that story. So why do some people think that she did? Go to 2007 when a campaign aide wrote an assessment of the race where he said Barack Obama's lack of American roots could hold him back in the primary. What he was talking about was Obama's unusual childhood, living some in Hawaii, some in Indonesia, thought that might not play very well with voters. He never said Obama wasn't born in the United States. In fact, we know of one Clinton campaign worker who tried to push that story out, got immediately dumped by the campaign. 
So what kept the story alive? Republicans embraced it and Donald Trump in particular. As Donald Trump started considering a run for the presidency himself, here we get to 2011 and suddenly he's showing up on TV saying, why doesn't he, Obama, show his birth certificate? He goes on to talk radio and on the internet saying, I'm starting to wonder myself whether or not he was born in this country. And in an even more pronounced way, he said, if he wasn't born in this country, which is a real possibility, then he's pulled one of the great cons in the story of politics. So you see how he's stacking up the doubt here. And then Barack Obama releases his long form birth certificate and everyone thinks the story is dead. It's finished, there's the proof he was born in America. But not so fast, we move forward and Trump starts bringing it up again. A lot of people do not think it, that birth certificate, was an authentic certificate. And then he keeps going, saying things on Twitter, for example. He jumps out there and he says, an extremely credible source has called my office and told me that Barack Obama's birth certificate is a fraud. And he keeps building on it. He never lets it entirely die. Every single one of these appearances is from Donald Trump. A lot of people feel it wasn't a proper certificate. And he never stopped with this. It kept coming up, telling CNN just this year, who knows about Obama? Who knows? Who knows? Who cares right now? I have my own theory on Obama. Bottom line, every bit of this came from Donald Trump. Hillary Clinton did not start it, and he did keep it going. Those are two facts, no matter how much Trump may try to deny them. At the White House today, President Obama himself declined to respond to Trump's public change on the issue. I was pretty confident about where I was born. Uh, I think most people were as well. Uh, and uh, my hope would be that uh, the presidential elect, uh, election reflects more serious issues than that. But Trump today raised another birther controversy. He alleged Clinton is to blame. Hillary Clinton and her campaign of 2008 started the birther controversy. I finished it. There is no evidence of that. Fact checks proving it to be false abound. Clinton's 2008 campaign did fight tooth and nail with President Obama, but she never questioned his birthplace. Trump not backing down or backing away from his view that a judge in one of his Trump University lawsuits is biased against him because the judge is Mexican American. If you are saying he can't do his job because of his race, is that not the definition of racism? I don't think so at all. Federal District Judge Gonzalo Curiel was born in Indiana, his parents from Mexico. This judge is giving us unfair rulings. Now I say why. Well, I want to, I'm building a wall, okay? And it's a wall between Mexico, not another country. But he's, in not, my, he's not from Mexico. In my opinion, he's from Indiana. He is he's Mexican, Mexican heritage, and he's very proud of it. In interviews that aired this weekend, Trump calling his reasoning common sense and going even further. If we were a Muslim judge, would you also feel like they wouldn't be able to treat you fair, fairly because of that policy of yours? Uh, it's possible, yes. Many top Republicans don't agree. Newt Gingrich, likely on Trump's short list for VP, blasting him. This is one of the worst mistakes Trump has made. And I think it's inexcusable. Claiming a person can't do their job because of their race is sort of like the textbook definition of a racist comment. I think that should be absolutely disavowed. It's absolutely unacceptable. But do I believe that Hillary Clinton is the answer? No, I do not. I do think these kinds of comments undercut these things, and I'm not going to even pretend to, to, to defend them. I'm going to defend our ideas. I'm going to defend our agenda. What, what matters to us most is our principles and the policies that come from those principles and our ability to give the people of this country a better way forward. A better way is what we're up to here. And we believe we have a better likelihood of passing that than we would have with President Clinton. So I'm not going to defend these kinds of comments because they're indefensible. 
I'm going to defend our ideas. I'm going to defend our majority. And I think our likelihood of getting these ideas into law are far more likely if we are unified as a party. And so I see it as my job as Speaker of the House to help keep our party unified. I think if we go into the fall as a divided party, we are, we are doomed to lose. I'm asking for the vote of every single African-American citizen in this country. What do you have to lose? You're living in poverty. Your schools are no good. You have no jobs. 58% of your youth is unemployed. What the hell do you have to lose? Uh, look at my African-American over here. Look at him. are shocking and shameful comments from the President of the United States. I'm sorry, but there's no other word one can use but racist. Uh, you cannot dismiss entire countries and continents as holes, <coughs> whose entire populations who are not white uh, are therefore not welcome. The positive comment on Norway uh, makes the underlying sentiment very clear. Um, and like the earlier comments made vilifying Mexicans and Muslims, the policy proposals targeting entire groups on grounds of nationality or religion, and the reluctance to clearly condemn the anti-Semitic and racist actions of the white supremacists in Charlottesville, all of these go against the universal values the world has been striving so hard to established since World War II and the Holocaust. This isn't just a story about vulgar language, it's about opening the door to humanity's worst side. It's about validating and encouraging racism and xenophobia that will potentially disrupt and even destroy the lives of many people. And that's perhaps the single most damaging and dangerous consequence of this type of comment by a major political figure. President Donald Trump's comments about four congresswomen are racist and strongly condemned. That's the conclusion of the U.S. House of Representatives, which passed a resolution to rebuke the president. It was backed by 240 votes to 187, but with only four Republicans giving their support, Trump has launched a series of attacks on the Congresswomen of Color, known as the Squad, telling them to go back to the crime-infested places from which they came. The politicians, Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez, Ayanna Presley, and Rashida Tlaib were born in the US, and Ilhan Omar came as a refugee aged 12. The remarks have been widely denounced, mainly by Democrats, who've renewed calls to launch impeachment proceedings against Trump. These comments from the White House 
are disgraceful and disgusting, and the comments are racist. How shameful to hear him continue to defend those offensive words, words that we have all heard him repeat, not only about our members, but about countless others. Well, the vast majority of Republicans have failed to condemn Trump's comments. I wonder if, when we're tempted to accuse our sister, our brother, our fellow American political foe, or even this Madam Speaker of racism. By the way, I do not believe the president is a racist. I do not believe the Speaker of this House is a racist. I do not believe the majority leader is a racist. I do not believe the minority leader is a racist. We can go down this line. I do not believe that. And while we insist on using this floor to litigate the propriety of statements made outside these walls, we assign a lot of wicked intent to a lot of tweets. And despite the widespread criticism of his comments, Trump has refused to back down and continues to tell the Congresswomen they can leave America. They should love our country. They shouldn't hate our country. You look at what they've said. I, I have clips right here. The most vile, horrible statements about our country, about Israel, about others. Uh, it's up to them to do what they want. They can leave, they can stay. They should love our country, and they should work for the good of our country. Despite the outrage over his latest tweets, the president appeared to be buoyant and confident. Expressing no regret, Donald Trump today only reinforced his incendiary message that political opponents with foreign heritage should consider leaving America. If you hate our country, if you're not happy here, you can leave. And that's what I say all the time. That's what I said in a tweet, which I guess some people think is controversial. A lot of people love it, by the way. A lot of people love it. But if you're not happy in the U.S., if you're complaining all the time, very simply, you can leave. You can leave right now. Come back if you want. Don't come back. It's okay, too. They're not happy here. They can leave. They can leave. And you know what? I'm, I'm sure that there'll be many people that won't miss them progressive Democratic Congresswomen who originally came from countries whose governments are a complete and total catastrophe, the worst, most corrupt and inept anywhere in the world. If they even have a functioning government at all, now loudly and viciously telling the people of the United States, the greatest and most powerful nation on earth, how our government is to be run. Why don't they go back and help fix the totally broken and crime infested places from which they came? Does it concern you that many people saw that tweet as racist and that uh, white nationalist groups are finding common cause with you on that point? It doesn't concern me because many people agree with me. Aim higher. We don't need to know anything about them personally. Talk about their policies. Senator, if those tweets were negative. Uh, I think they're American citizens who are duly elected. AOC and this crowd are a bunch of communists. They hate Israel. They hate our own country. They hate our country. They hate it, I think, with a passion. Now, it's possible I'm wrong. The voter will decide. These are people that if they don't like it here, they can leave. Under persistent questioning that he is a racist, he replied only that Democrats would regret That's backing the four the congresswomen. If they want to gear their wagons around these four people, I think they're going to have a very tough election because I don't think the people of the United States will stand for it. These are the members of Congress he was attacking but did not name, suggesting that they should go back to their home countries, even though three were born in America. This was a tweet yesterday that triggered the political storm. Why don't they go back and help fix the totally broken and crime infested places from which they came? These places need your help badly. You can't leave fast enough. To that provocative racist trope that was partly aimed at her, the Palestinian American Congresswoman Rashida Tlaib put out this video response on Twitter. I want you to know that you belong, that this is our country, and no amount of hate filled bullying from the White House is going to change that. We're going to fight back together and we're going to become stronger for it. Perhaps Trump's primary target is a young liberal, Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez. 
She is of Puerto Rican heritage and today was dismissive of the attack. He relies on racism, division, and anti-immigrant sentiment to consolidate power because he does not have a positive vision for the future of America. Congresswoman Elan Omar, who did come to America as a refugee from Somalia, tweeted back simply that Trump is the worst, most corrupt and inept president we have seen. Few Republicans here on Capitol Hill have dared criticize the president and one of his key allies accused the four women of being extremists. This crowd are a bunch of communists. They hate Israel. They hate our own country. They're calling the guards uh, along our border, the Border Patrol agents, concentration camp guards. The latest comments have left some of America's most respected politicians pleading with the president. We want a president that brings us together. So, Mr. President, I'm not asking you. I'm begging you to stop this, please. But the president is most unlikely to stop. Not least because his 2020 re-election campaign is about to begin in earnest. President Trump is doubling down on his assault on the city of Baltimore. As Lisa Desjardins reports, there are echoes of previous attacks of his on urban areas of the United States and their leaders. And this fallout this morning over President Trump's repeated attacks on Congressman Elijah Cummings and his Baltimore area district, calling it rat and rodent infested. Once again, the president is denying his attack on the African-American congressman and the majority black city is racist. Our senior congressional correspondent, Mary Bruce, is there on Capitol Hill. Mary, president has up and tweeting about this again this morning. There seems to be a real pattern here. Yeah, Cecilia, this is now the second time in just two weeks that the president has been accused of launching racist attacks against a member of Congress. And the president's attacks against Chairman Cummings have been relentless. As you mentioned, he is back at it again this morning. And now the president is trying to turn the table, insisting he is not being racist. The Democrats are. In more than a dozen tweets over the weekend, the president disparaging Congressman Elijah Cummings, calling his majority black district around Baltimore, Maryland, a disgusting rat and rodent infested mess where no human being would want to live. Using the hashtag blacks for Trump 2020, the condemnation from Democrats swift. Well, the president is, as he usually is, or often is disgusting and racist. The racist president who attacks people because they are African-Americans. The president's Twitter offensive comes after Cummings grilled Trump's acting Homeland Security Secretary about conditions along the border. Come on, man. What's that about? None of us would have our children in that position. They are human beings. It's the second time in two weeks that Trump has come under fire for racial attacks against members of Congress. But now Trump insists Democrats are the ones playing the race card, tweeting Cummings is racist. The president's chief of staff insists Trump's comments are appropriate. If I had poverty in my district like they have in Baltimore, I'd get fired. And I think the president is right to raise that. It has absolutely zero to do with race. In Baltimore today, condemnation of President Trump's words about the city, seen there as stoking racial divide. From the left, civil rights activist Reverend Al Sharpton. But he has a particular venom for blacks and people of color. And the right, former Republican Party chairman and former Maryland Lieutenant Governor Michael Steele. Mr. President, your reprehensible comments are like water off a duck's back when it comes to this community. It just washes over them. This after the president fired off over a dozen weekend tweets criticizing Maryland Congressman Elijah Cummings and his Baltimore area district. He called Cummings a brutal bully and said his district is considered the worst in the USA, adding that the district, which includes part of Baltimore and its suburbs, is a disgusting rat and rodent infested mess. The Baltimore Sun defended its city with an op-ed blasting the president as returning to an old standby, using the most emotional and bigoted of arguments. The paper also stressed pride points like Baltimore's Inner Harbor and Johns Hopkins Hospital. The most recent FBI crime statistics showed Baltimore with the nation's highest murder rate and second highest violent crime rate. But Cummings District also has above average rates of college education and home prices, and it's the second wealthiest black district in the country. This is coming up amidst tensions between the president and Cummings, who gave this response last week. Do you believe President Trump is a racist? I believe he is, he, yes, no doubt about it. 
Cummings chairs the House Oversight Committee, which is investigating the White House on several fronts. Last Thursday, he authorized subpoenas for White House advisors, including Mr. Trump's daughter and son-in-law, Ivanka Trump and Jared Kushner. And earlier this month, Cummings slammed the administration's previous zero-tolerance policy that led to thousands of separated families at the border. This is not the first time the president has responded to criticism from a black lawmaker this way. I don't see this president-elect as a legitimate president. Georgia Congressman and civil rights icon John Lewis said that to NBC in 2017, commenting on Russian interference in the election. The next day, Mr. Trump tweeted, Congressman John Lewis should spend more time on fixing and helping his district and called it crime infested. More recently, the president faced bipartisan criticism for tweeting that four Democratic Congresswomen of color should go back where they came from. Three were born in the U.S. and all are citizens. Like that attack, Mr. Trump is showing no signs of backing down or apologizing for his latest. Instead, the president pointed to a rival's words about Baltimore. You would think that you were in a third world country. That was Vermont Senator Bernie Sanders after touring part of Baltimore in 2015. It was a tour meant to highlight a specific rundown area and income inequality. The White House and president insist the tweets were not about race. What is this about? Chief of Staff Mick Mulvaney Sunday said the Cummings attacks are about his criticism of the president's border policy. What this is about, though, is the president fighting back against what he saw as being illegitimate attacks about the border in the hearing this week. When the president hears lies like that, he is going to fight back, and that's what you saw in those tweets. Some Republicans are struggling to defend Trump, but they aren't condemning him either. To focus on an entire city, call it rat and rodent infested, you see no problem with that? Well, of, of, of course, he shouldn't, you know, I, I don't think they're going to in, invite him uh, to throw out a, the first pitch at a baseball game anytime soon. The Baltimore Sun publishing this scathing editorial. The headline, better to have a few rats than to be one. And some city natives like CNN anchor Victor Blackwell moved to tears. People get up and go to work there. They care for their families there. They love their children who pledge allegiance to the flag, just like people who live in districts of congressmen who support you, sir. They are Americans, too. Now, former First Lady Michelle Obama is also sending a message of support, giving a shout out on Twitter to this Baltimore step team who have embraced her slogan, when they go low, we go high. As for Chairman Cummings, he's also defending himself on Twitter, writing, Mr. President, I go home to my district daily. Each morning I wake up and I go and fight for my neighbors. George. Okay, Mary, thanks very much. It's almost that the president refused to accept that he's the president of every state, every city in the United States, including Baltimore. Mr. Trump is a racist. The country has seen Mr. Trump court white supremacists and bigots. You have heard him call poorer countries holes. His private, in private, he is even worse. He once asked me if I could name a country run by a black person that wasn't a hole. This was when Barack Obama was president of the United States. And while we were once driving through a struggling neighborhood in Chicago, he commented that only black people could live that way. And he told me that black people would never vote for him because they were too stupid. And yet, I continue to work for him. U.S. President Donald Trump has denied being a racist in response to reports that he recently used derogatory language. No, no, I'm not a racist. I am the least racist person you have ever interviewed. That I can tell you. Could you say, Director Mueller, that the president was credible? I can't answer that question. Director Mueller, isn't it fair to say that the president's written answers were not only inadequate and incomplete because he didn't answer many of your questions, but where he did, his answer showed that he wasn't always being truthful? Uh, there, uh, I would say, uh, generally. Generally. Director Mueller, it's one thing for the president to lie to the American people about your investigation, falsely claiming that you found no collusion and no obstruction, but it's something else 
all together for him to get away with not answering your questions and lying about them. And as a former law enforcement officer of almost 30 years, I find that a disgrace to our criminal justice system.